Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. Welcome back. Me welcome back? You welcome back. Weren't you just in Atlanta for a week? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, Pro Tour Guilds of Ravnica uh, with quite the metagame development, you know. Yeah, this was uh, something different. You know, it's interesting to me because the Pro Tour was so deep in the standard format, right? Like, these decks, I mean, or the, rather, Guilds of Ravnica has been out for weeks and weeks. We've seen multiple big kind of Star City events. We've seen multiple Grand Prix. Uh, we had a clear, you know, call in a winner. And then we have this top eight. Yeah, and, th- and this, well, I think this one's in particular interesting because this top eight is not necessarily... Uh, exactly representative of uh, which decks did the best as this top eight featured a very disproportionate amount of draft winners. It looked like there wasn't actually as much edge as there always is. Um, And even though this top eight was uh, very skewed towards Boros Agro, the uh, there were several decks that were actually quite good. It just so happened that some of the, uh, you know, best draft records belong to people playing Boros. So, so yeah, but go ahead. I mean, even if we say Boros, right, and there were, technically speaking, there were uh, six red and white decks with, uh, you know, a Danto Vanguard in them uh, in this top eight. I think there are two, if not three, distinctly different, quote, Boros Agro decks here. Agree completely. They, they are not the same deck, right? So I think if you look at like Dizani's deck, which has Aurelia Exemplar of Justice in the main deck and Heroic Reinforcements, I think this is like an aggro deck. It's it's more aggro than this the, is Boros tokens, man. Yeah, it's but it's 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 act not really so like the Boros Angels decks that we've seen before. It's only got a real. No, 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 no. Just but Boros tokens. I mean, I think Aurelia is just kind of a powerful card. Um, yeah, and then we have, like, Michael Burnett's deck, which is just a white weenie deck, basically, right? It was also, the winner was uh, basically just a white weenie deck. I think, all like, most of the rest of them were very much this fast white aggro style in varying amounts of how much did they, uh, you know, how much red did they really want to include. But, like, uh, the biggest distinction, I think once you play Banalish Marshall... That's kind of uh, the thing that's setting the pace for your deck, you know? Yeah, so like we said, like Dizani didn't have Benalish Marshall, right? Which is one of the right. most powerful cards, I think, in a lot of situations, including Heads Up. But he didn't have it in his deck, yet he had room for four copies of Goblin Instigator. So he is, he's pretty... Well, that's, that's part of the here. reason... That's part of it, is that once you play enough, like, you know, I mean, Dizani actually had four basic mountains in his deck, the uh, the other competitors, uh, for the most part, weren't playing Mountain at all. They were definitely uh, very, very, very plain centric. Some of them had one Mountain, you know, for that set of equity. But but the uh, in general, I think that the primary formula that we saw was uh, mono white with uh, you know a pretty big variety of different types of one drops that people uh, you know put alongside Sky Marcher Aspirant and Dotless Bodyguard. Um, most of the red splashes that people had were very minimal. You know, a lot of these people didn't have any red cards in their main deck at all, just sideboarding uh, things like Experimental Frenzy in particular, and to a degree, uh, you know, basically just Experimental Frenzy and Bane Fire were the Bane primary Fire. ones, which is, you know, that's definitely the move you always called. And then uh, even the occasional, for instance, uh, LSV was playing uh, two copies of Aurelia in the sideboard. But in retrospect, they would, uh, I think that they were unsure, like they're not so sure that they really should have played the Aurelias. Because even when they board that one mountain in, that's only twenty one land. It's hard to cast. I mean, like I think th- I think they got a a little bit of bad data before the event with regards to some mistaken hypergeometric math about the probability of being able to play Aurelia by turn six. I mean, I saw some matches that were decided like one player had four land in play for three turns while the game was slipping away, and he just had 
we were a Dawnbringer in hand, it never got cast. And you'd think, like, four draw steps later, still no. No, these decks have, like, 20 lands. Uh, you already won the lottery if you have four land in play. Uh, one of the things I thought was really uh, uh, important, by the way, about Luis's deck, um, the the combination of Leon and Vanguard oh, yeah. and Ajani's Pride Mate. I mean, Leon and Vanguard was described uh, as being, like, that one being the the best of the post Dauntless Bodyguard Sky Marcher Aspirant mix, and in fact, they only played three Sky Marcher Aspirant and just four Leon and Vanguard. So, actually, let me ask you this: Let's just go through like maybe two or three of these lists more specifically, then maybe end on Luis's deck because I think his deck is substantively different than than some of the other ones because I think they're just really different decks. You know, like his deck has just got. Massive dimensions different from, like, say, Andrew Ellen Bogan's deck. The ability, like, I, mean, I figure we just could start on it and compare to the others. I do okay. agree that it's got some sweet action uh, that's worth calling out because it's such a different sort of take. The The life gain package just seems so, uh, you know, so compelling here. The combination of four Healer's Hawk, four Leonin Vanguard, and uh, the four legions landing, allowing him to play a sort of mini soul sisters sort of strategy. Oh yeah, because he's got a Johnny's pride mate. So if you look at Luis's one drop choices, he's got four legions landing. Right, other folks maybe only played three or or you know just not four, and he's got four healers hawk. So in most other decks, sky marcher aspirant is the first choice. Right, they've got four sky marcher aspirant, and then they choose other cards. Right, but Luis has got four Healer's Hawk uh, to set up that Pride Mate. Like, you go first turn Healer's Hawk, go, you know, opponent plays their Aspirant or something, you play second turn Pride Mate, you're in with the Healer's Hawk, you've already got a 3 3. And in these matchups, like, Luis himself only has two Conclave Tribunal, right? If, you, if that Ajani's Pride Mate starts going off in the mirror or the pseudo mirror, they're just done. They can't beat it. It's, but once it gets to like 4 4, 5 5, it's just the Abyss or, you know, it's going to kill them. Yeah, that's actually uh, when he so in the the finals, obviously, very unfortunate game five uh, ended up mulling to four. Um, the the five card hand was not good, <laughs> but it at least had a land. And there were some uh, people who were wondering if that should have been the keep. And I think there's good arguments both ways. But I think my understanding is the thinking was that uh it's so hard in the white, you know, white aggro mirror to be down so many cards and then have a slow draw that doesn't really. Oh, I mean, it, but like if you go to four, at least if you find one of the he, if you find a Johnny's pride mate, and then like two land, if you find a Johnny's pride mate two land and any of the one drops to gain life. You're really doing like something. You, you have a chance, right? Right. But, Even if you're down all those cards, you got something going. The problem is, I think the I, I watched the whole top eight, and so many of the matches were you know white red aggro and white red aggro, and it seemed to me that these matchups were so tactical and so much about like just the material and the tempo that you drew the material, like they're like. The, the way that you get ahead is by forcing the opponent into bad blocks. And if one guy just has way more stuff than the other guy, it's really hard to put them into that position unless Luis got a draw like you're talking about, like Healer's Hawk into Johnny's Pride Mate or something. These are decks that are A, relying on the City's Blessing, and B, have cards like Pride of Conquerors. You're just, you could just literally be drawing like stuff that's just not effectual. Uh, with a with a small number of cards. Yep. Uh, so this, uh, but Healer's Hawk was sort of this. This this was the weekend, the real breakout weekend for Healer's Hawk, and we saw a lot of it all over the place. But uh, by contrast, you know, it's kind of interesting if you look at the uh, if you look at the the build played by Tay Young Howe. Uh, who only featured two Healer's Hawk, but had room for four Rustwing Falcons. Rustwing Falcon contains Healer's Hawk, obviously. 
And uh, I was asking Josh Utterly, in, like, what is the theory? What, why, why do you rust wing Falcon? Like, he, even if, like, obviously, without having a Johnny's pride mate, he doesn't value the life gain as much. But, but why, why, why rust wing Falcon? And of course, the answer is Goblin Chain Whirler. I, I think like. I think that the world is spoiled that these decks were do were able to do so well this past weekend. I mean, did they just forget about Basic Mountain despite having it in their sideboard in some cases? No, it's just that how many people like at the last Pro Tour, half the field play Goblin Chain Whirler. At this Pro Tour, it was barely what, like thirteen or fourteen percent? Yeah, it was not a huge percentage relative to the white aggro decks, but there were like one or two that did exceptionally well, right? There was one with a one loss record uh, and then with an undefeated day one. Um, I think like chain whirlers and point removal are are going to be solid against these builds. Oh, yeah. In particular, I think chain whirler stock is rising on that one. The uh, the uh, the decks that did well pe- this past weekend, it, and Boros, don't get me wrong, Boros was like basically tied for the uh, most popular deck on day two. Day one, uh, Golgari was safely ahead, but Golgari actually had a losing win rate, whereas Boros was safe, was well above average. Um, but then on day two, Boros and Golgari were neck and neck with regards to popularity, with Boros having a much better win percentage. Um but other strategies that did really well, red wasn't even though we you know we described it as not being super popular, it actually did above average and it did better on day two than it did on day one. Uh, Jess guy did way so Jess guy below average, uh, Golgari below average as we had mentioned. The Arclight Phoenix decks actually did all right, and uh, most of the random weird stuff that people played all just got killed. So, Patrick, while we're yep. looking at Taejun Howe's build, so this is a deck that's got 21 lands and three copies of Heroic Reinforcements. What do you think about this, this setup? How do you, what do you think about Reinforcements at all? Well, I know that I got smashed by it in the first round of Constructed. <laughs> yeah, it looked fine. Uh, it's, I, I don't know. To me personally, I, I don't think I, I like the venerated Luxodon Heroic Reinforcement build as much. Um, but I think it's fine. Uh, it, it gives you a lot of value. Like when somebody else plays sorcery speed sweepers, being able to follow it up with, uh, heroic reinforcements where it, it hits reasonably hard on the follow up, but it also, if they don't play the sweeper, they're taking a ton of damage. If they got nothing, it still just slams for four, right? Yeah. At least, and that's not even counting uh, if it gets you know benefits from uh, from stuff like uh, the I guess the the Bedalish Marshall is not usually going to be there on the follow up, but but yeah, it's I think it I think it's reasonable even at these super low land counts. Uh, I think it's reasonable. I I still don't you know. I, I I would play lower to the ground, but then again, I I don't play Rustwing Falcon. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So talking about one drops you might want to play, let's just jump back to Michael Burnett's deck. Um, he's got two copies of Healer's Hawk, but he's got four copies of Snub Horn Sentry. Blech. That's got even less power. <laughs> nope. Than Rustwing Falcon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The least wild Nakatl. I'm not into it. Uh, the Ellen Bogan, who won the tournament, also had four copies of Snubhorn Century. So this card is a 3-3 three, three for, for white if you've got the city's blessing, right? So we're, we're banking on blessing here. Yeah. Yeah, we are. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I just can't. I can't. I can't even. No? Uh, no, I, I, I think that... Uh, I, I just think that so Sky Marcher Aspirant and Dauntless Bodyguard are obviously good. And I, I think that Healer's Hawk is solid. And it but if it's great in Luis's deck. Definitely. But I I just think that the uh the Leonin is just so much better than people are giving credit to. The Leonin Vanguard. So I don't know, man. I think that the uh this you know, it's cute. It's cute. The Snubhorn Sentry, it's cute, but I don't... 
Yeah. Yeah, put me down for a uh, Leona and Vanguard kind of guy than, rather than a Snubhorn Sentry. Uh, that said, I mean, I don't want to take anything away. Obviously, Andrew Ellenbogen's list uh, served him quite well, and it was definitely a nice, streamlined, uh, very straightforward, consistent build. And uh, that, that having you know two land in the sideboard instead of just one, and having the slightly bigger, you know, the ability to go just slightly bigger with both Experimental Frenzy and Dijani, you know, three of each. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on Response Resurgence out of the board, by the way. Oh, well, that card is that card is pretty hip. I actually really like Response. So it's very easy to cast in this deck. Um, I mean, any land casts it because you can cast for white, white. You don't have to have red, even though. Um, it's it's Boros casting cost. Uh, I don't know how often you're going to do the resurgence side, but I assume that if you did, it would be spectacular. Yeah, it's kind of a nice extra option. One of the things I like about it is the ability to do stuff like, for instance, have an answer to your opponent's fast. Uh, like, if you're if you're at a spot where you want to have an answer to a fast threat of some sort, but you also don't want to be stuck with dead cards in case they don't draw their 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 creature. You know, response resurgence definitely has that. Well, the five damage on response is the perfect amount of damage for killing Aurelia's and Dawnbringers. And I think right. that is probably very key to the specific card choice, right? Because you could theoretically just play like Lava Coil or something, right? That's a yeah, but, card. Yeah, and that is, you know, obviously less damage. But I also think it does matter that you don't just get flooded with too many reactive cards and not enough proactive cards. What do you think about these Tokatli Honor Guards in the sideboard? You know, when we were looking at Grand Prix deck lists a couple of weeks ago, Tokatli Honor Guard had been promoted to main deck in so many of the successful white decks, whether white, green, or white, red. That's a and it's isn't it like actually a pretty good card for containing people, Sky Marcher aspirants and. Dauntless bodyguards like one three is actually a, a nice body uh, if you're expecting a lot of two ones. Well, so I think part of the challenge is that uh, he wants his own, uh, you know, he wants his own Sky Marcher aspirants and Dauntless bodyguards to actually trigger, you know, and that's to say nothing of Venerated Luxodon. When you're playing a Venerated Luxodon deck, you cannot be leading with the Kotli Honor Guard. All right, but but I think that Takatli Honor Guard. I think it was a smart call to not main deck them this week. I think Golgari being on the decline, uh, Golgari, and to a degree, uh, you know the uh, the various. But really, it's mostly Golgari, but I mean Crackling Drake to a degree. But I think that these white decks play too many enters the battlefield triggers to really get a lot of mileage out of it. So I think that it's if you're going to play it, it should be in the sideboard. And uh, I don't know that you need it, but if you want it, I think the, the sideboard is definitely a reasonable spot. I just think that these white decks get too much value to the main deck. It. So you said white decks are really like very just white weenie, right? Like the red cards are in the sideboard. Could be as little as one Bane Fire. I mean, are they getting, I mean, I'm sure you played against these kind of decks. Uh, they are. Experimental Frenzy is the key. Yeah, that's it. Like they... Experimental Frenzy is just so good for them. It's just so, so, so good for them after sideboarding. Oh, it's got to also be setting up City's Blessing for them, right? Because they get to play so many Easily. permanents. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. Easily. Easily. They keep going. Yeah, no. Uh, I, I, it, it's definitely Experimental Frenzy was the uh, – it's a must-have out of the board of these decks. Okay. Um, so you mentioned some Drakes a second ago. Uh, even though there were six Boros aggro decks in the top eight of Grand, I'm oh, sorry, not Grand Prix, Pro Tour, Guilds of Ravnica, we, there was a Drake deck there too. Yep, yep. Uh, and, you know, Just Guy Control, not without an appearance. I mean, this Just Guy list was not very far off from the list that Wafo and I played at the last, uh, at the uh, at the event. The biggest differences between the lists that we played uh First of all, I really like Wilson Mox uh, keeping Niv Mizzet resigned to the sideboard. Wafo and I actually main deck a couple copies, and uh, I don't think it was right to main deck them this time. Um, just the format just got too fast. And uh, instead, instead of those two, uh, he had an extra Teferi and a Search for his Kanta. I don't love Search for his Kanta, but obviously it's okay. Um, I do like Teferi. Do you uh, not like Search for his Kanta because... Um 
like it's just so slow against White Weenie or some other reason? Uh, I get a lot of people, because I think that you just – your ability to go over the top of people with things like Chemister's Insight and Teferi. Like I think Chemister's Insight quietly takes up a lot more mana than people realize. And so like it's actually hard even if you flip Search for his Kata to just have enough mana to be using it all the time. You've just got such other things to do with your mana. So I I don't mind not playing Search for Iskanta, but... So this is the big point of contention, I think, in Jeskai Control decks. What do you think about three copies of Crackling Drake in the main? I don't think that should be a point of contention. I think you just have to play Crackling Drake. You just have to play Crackling Drake? Yeah. Yeah, I I think you have to play Crackling Drakes. And I like three. Uh, Part of the reason why I like three instead of two or four, I think you really do want to draw it. You really like, but I I think that the second one you draw is way worse than it might seem in other decks because of how much you can fall behind if you have to tap out to play it early. Because very often you're not playing it on turn four, you're playing on turn six or something. See, my bias would be against Crackling Drake. So tell me, why do you think you have to play it? Uh, It's the only way you can reasonably beat Golgari. Like if you you have to you have to be able to win fast, and you can't afford to just try to sit around and set up an expansion explosion. I think the Azur's Gateway stuff is just so bad against uh, a lot of the, the the more the the faster aggressive decks. Like you just don't have that mana laying around. I think it's great in the mirror, but the format has gotten way too fast for the Azur's Gateway stuff. And I think if you play against this new breed of Golgari, they will just beat up on you if you are trying to win. First of all, Niv Mizzet is bad against them. They are so ready for Niv Mizzet. Oh my god! They're just going to so, punch it with Vivian Reed. Is that the the? Big that's problem? not the only way. They got plenty of ways to punch it. But like the ability to uh, like Niv Mizzet just coming down and then just dying to whatever, compared to uh, if Crackling Drake comes down, it's less of an investment. And Crackling Drake being able to uh, like Crackling Drake just gets the best of their Vraska's contempt so much more often than Teferi does. It's just tempo is too important, you know? And I think the ability to play Crackling Drake for six is important. How often do you have the play of casting Deafening Clarion for lifelink with Crackling Drake in play, whether or not you're sweeping oh, yeah. their guys? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I've always swept their guys at the same time, too. But in theory, you could just do it for that, too. I think the combination of Crackling Drake and Deafening Clarion is a very much needed dimension for this deck. A card that I think is missing in, well, not not that I think is missing, but it's like just stands out to me that's missing uh, in Wilson Mock's Jeskai control deck is Starve Extinction. What do you, what do you think about that card in, in Jeskai? Uh, that's wild because, so I, I, I like not playing a main deck. I think it's just too slow in this white aggro metagame. However, uh, I played it in the sideboard and it seemed really good. Um, I would, I don't know. I would, I would generally err on the side of wanting to play it. So I don't know. It I can't. Seems- really good to me in Jeskai in this format. I mean, obviously, you got to play it in such a way that you're not, like, blowing up your own Teferi or something like that, but um, you know, just it's so powerful. Like, there's no getting around it. Yep, and may, if, if it's a smart move, uh, it might be on the back of the fact that Golgari is on the decline, so it might be a calculated risk, like a calculated gamble of cutting it uh, in thinking that you're the, the Gal- you're not going to face that many Golgari decks, but I... You know, I think I would still sideboard two copies. I just think it's too important against these decks with Vivian Reed, Carnage Tyrant, all this card advantage, all these two for ones. Um, but you know, it's 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 fine not uh, if if you're if you're just gambling on uh, Golgari not being uh, that big. And once you get to the top tables, that seemed to be a strong strategy. So. You, uh, one difference, oh, by the way, okay. uh, one difference if I could on Wilson Mox list that I, I think is worth calling out. I. I just can't get into two mountains. I just can't get into the two mountains. I think that I would instead play a, a at least I would I would cut w- at least one for uh, a meandering river, which I did not play at the pro tour. I just played uh, I just played islands. I just played six islands, but um, I think I would play the meandering river and possibly even a plains because I think once you move Niv visit to the sideboard, you could afford to have one maybe. It's not like you need Crackling Drake on four all the time, and I think that um, I think that moving forward, I would uh, I would want to bring Settle the Wreckage back. I think Settle the Wreckage is uh, very very well positioned in the current metagame. Yeah, even with all these people playing uh, a couple copies of Banefire, 
I think the set of the wreckage is just too important between its ability to help catch you up against a white aggro deck, despite them having, uh, you know, cards like Dotless bodyguard or playing some haste threats the, that combined with how much you need to have answers to carnage tyrant. It's just too brutal not to. Well, so the thing is, even if they have Banefire, some of them only have one, right? It's not like everyone's like maxing out on four. Not everyone even has a mountain, right? So there, there's some, there's some space there, but I think that when you're playing Settle the Wreckage in the context of a deck that's got four copies of Definite Clarion, which I assume you think is, you have to have a must. four Definite Clarion before Auto, automatic, right? automatic, automatic, and then some number of Cleansing Nova. It looks like two is the common number of Cleansing Nova. Yeah, yeah. but I, I'm not sure you need the two Cleansing Novas. I, I would play. I think I would main deck two Settle the Wreckage and one Cleansing Nova. Yeah, I think that I would want to play Settle main deck as well, and the reason is like. They can't really play around it if you're also playing for Definite Clarion. That's really the thing, right? Like, holding back so they don't get blown out by Settle is just giving you time. And then you can blow them out some other way. And so that's one of the reasons that I think it's so good. And like you said before, it gets around their stuff like Dauntless Bodyguard. It gets around stuff like giving all their guys indestructible until end of turn. Um, and I got hit by that one, too. <laughs> all the narrow answers, all the narrow threats... That's the problem with playing a control deck that everybody already has the deck list for, that everybody sees coming, you know? Well, they know what your toolbar, uh, your, your toolbox is, right? And they can, they can get a little tempo and just have the right counter for it. And there is another control deck that I'd like to speak on, but first we should definitely touch on Yuya Watanabe's Is It uh, Crackling Drake deck. I was pretty surprised looking at this deck you you played the same number of crackling drakes as Wilson Mock. I thought this was the deck that you always play for crackling drakes. Yeah, that's kind of interesting, right? Like this is a little bit of a uh, you know killing your darlings type of thing. Kind of interesting to use four Enigma Drake and three crackling drake. It's yeah. definitely a statement. A lot of creatures in this deck. You know, um, of course, I was talking to to John Samuel Finkel, who is perhaps the world's biggest fan of Goblin Electromancer. He thinks it's a must, but some yeah, a lot of people don't realize it's. The the F in JFM stands for Samuel. <laughs> <laughs> All. Um, so uh, the uh, the yeah. So the Electromancer. Some people don't play any, right? But you know, Yuya's has got a ton of creatures here, right? Like th- this is you know he cannot have three instances of sorcery sometimes. He drew too many creatures, right? Is that is that a possibility? Uh, yeah, but I think the combination of having effectively uh, 16 cantrips, it's uh, that combined with stuff like how Radical Idea sort of counts double. And Maximized Velocity, velocity also does, right? Right. So I don't think this is you're actually going to have too big of an issue triggering it, you know, particularly since you have some time in the early turns, you're you're playing creatures and uh, every spell you draw is being stockpiled. You might not always be the quickest to bring back an art like Phoenix a third time or whatever, but who cares? Um, I thought that you use sideboard was pretty cool, um, although one murmuring mystic. I- in testing and in playing in tournaments, I thought Murmuring Mystic was one of the best performing cards out of the Is It Drake sideboard. I feel like I'd want more. What do you think? I'm not sure. I don't have enough preparation with it. It seems fine, but it does seem slow. And I think that the sacrifice that's being made here is that uh, you, you wanted to have a diverse mix of threats. Everybody's expecting Murmuring Mystic going in. And I think that Murmuring Mystic is deceptively bad against uh, people who are prepared. I mean, if you like it, it, it's it's just more of the same in many ways of what you already have. Whereas I think Ral is it Viceroy and Niv miss it their ability to just win on win the game on their own plus obviously firemind's research is like a whole new game plan too and like this is like a way above average amount of threat diversification so i think it's interesting being able to go different directions instead of just the version that people were prepared for oh, that yeah. said that said i always thought the murmuring mystic looked good when i saw it well it depends if you're playing green decks like one five is brutal when the green deck is pre- uh, presenting so many 2-1 creatures. And once you untap, even if they're like a March of the Multitudes-type deck, Sapperling and, um, Sapperling and Migration-type deck, you just completely outclass them. You're just drawing cards, and you're producing flyers. It's, it's uh, very, very difficult. Like you, you can 
you can shoot their uh, Vivian Reed out of the, you know, come down from the sky. It's all, all great when that card is online. Yeah, and uh, one advantage, and it's funny that this is an advantage, but one advantage of the Murmuring uh, Mystic is that it doesn't fly. Which is, I think, deceptively important for this deck built around Enigma Drake, Crackling Drake, Cyborging Niv Mizzet. The uh, to you know, it, it, it's not as big of a deal for the Arclight Phoenix, but one of the breakout sideboard cards, and I think a card that could be uh, sick tech moving forward. Uh, the uh, the Harpooner, Kral Harpooner. So Kral Harpooner was actually one of the green cards that enticed uh, Ben Stark to splash green in his white aggro deck instead of red because he liked the Kral Harpooner so much. The Harpooner, which as a reminder is uh, one in a green for a 3-2 reach. And when it enters the battlefield, you choose up to one target creature with flying you don't control. Kral Harpooner gets plus X until on a turn, where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard, and then you may have Kral Harpooner fight that creature. So uh, when you drop Kral Harpooner against a Crackling Drake or an Enigma Drake, even if you don't get to free roll them, you know, the spots where they only have one spell in their in their graveyard— and you just get to kill their guy for free. Even if you don't, even if that's not the way that this game is shaken out, having a two mana kill spell for their for their lethal threats in the spots where you need it, as well as having a two mana three two, so instead you can just play it proactively. That it's such a cheap answer that can be used as a solid proactive threat, so that you don't just get you know answer flooded. And then what's more, and where it gets really spicy is, wow, do you get to dominate the Healer's Hawk mirrors. When your opponent drops a Healer's Hawk and you just drop Crowl Harpooner, <laughs> that is brutal. And it's not like you just, I mean, you, you kill the Hawk for free on the way in, but now you have a 3-2 reach. You can just do things with it, like block the next one I that mean, might come by. Honestly, you just convinced me. I think I've just become a green white aggro guy over the course of the last like forty five seconds. Well, if you this think that that fantastic. was fantastic, so if you think that was uh, convincing, let's go a step further. Well, Boros was one of the winningest decks. You know what the winningest strategy was for strategies that had double-digit players? It was green-white. For instance, if you look at Kenta Harain's Celestia Tokens deck, who uh, who actually crushed it in the constructed portion and suffered a bit, you know, went uh, 8-2 or better, either went 8-2 or 8-1-1 in constructed, uh, Kenta's list featured a... Uh, it, you know, on the surface, it's primarily just a Celestia Tokens deck. It's got Legion's Landing, History of Benalia, Amari, Soul of the Accord, Venerated Luxodon, Sap Rolling Migration, March of the Multitudes, all that usual stuff we see uh, with Flower, Flourish, and Trostani for uh, big payoffs in addition to the uh, Venerated Luxodon. But uh, he also had in the sideboard both Kral Harpooner, and then Nolhide Ferox, which is kind of a fun one. The uh, the Haunted Wumpus of Guilds of Ravnica. Yes, yes, yes. Being able to uh, drop the Nolhide Ferox um, as sort of a, a fast tempo play. In particular, I think that the amount that people board in, like little sweepers and small damage things, you know, like if somebody else is playing minus two, minus two, or definite Clarion or whatever, and you just play no hide Ferox, it actually makes life pretty awkward for them. Sure. Uh, what do you think about three copies of Amara's Soul of the Accord? Uh, it's so Amara Soul of the Accord. You're talking about why is three instead of four? Because I think using it is awesome when you're playing four Conclave Tribunal and you're playing uh four Venerated Luxodon. Oh yeah, because I think like I would want to play four specifically because that two into three play with Conclave Tribunal is so good, right? Like imagine you went like Legion's Landing, Amara Soul of the Accord, Conclave Tribunal. You're like already set up. 
one of the reasons why I think that three is also kind of cutting it a little tight is that you really do want to have some stuff to bring back with a Johnny adversary of tyrants. But that said, I could understand if you just don't want to like if you just don't want to draw the second copy, you know, like it is a legend. I don't know. Every time I have a Mars Hole of the Accord, my opponent kills it or I win. So <laughs> like if I've got a second one, I'm going to win. Right. If they're not killing the first one or if they killed the first one, I wanted the second one. But that card is the, such a takeover of the game card. It is so vulnerable, though. Yeah. So you want another one. <laughs> uh, another advantage to Ajani, by the way, in this deck, there's two copies here. But Ajani, well, most like there's an awful lot of put a plus one, plus one counter on up to two different tar- creatures, you know, doing that ability a lot. The uh, minus two ability, one other very powerful play that we saw a lot of over the weekend was returning Kral Harpooner with Ajani. Oh, you, wow. isn't that really strong? That's just like, that's like just Vivian Reed, right? Like <laughs> Vivian Reed's middle ability. Yeah. Except and, for you get and, to keep a three, two. And uh, Kenta played Vivian Reed as well, but it is worth noting that even uh, like in this deck, Vivian Reed is, it's still good, but it's not as good as you might think compared to like when you're used to how good it is in the Golgari decks, because the Golgari decks have so many creatures. This deck, remember, Saproy Migration, Flower Flourish, March of the Mall. Oh, so you're just missing a lot. Exactly. Well, you always hit land. Yeah, well. But you're not right. getting the you're not getting the the Carnage Tyrant goods that that you know you're not getting all the Jade Light Ranger Gul, uh, Carnage Tyrant stuff that that you do in Golgari. But it's still good. It's still good. So you like this sideboard with the Nullhide Ferox? I think that if I were going to play like a a green white aggro deck, um, as opposed to like a white weenie deck splashing green, right? Like a green white aggro deck or a green white tokens deck, I think that I would meaningfully want. Um, you know, the Tokatli Honor Guard and probably some big angels, right? Like, this deck doesn't, doesn't, I guess he's got Tristani Discordant also. Well, and Venerate Luxodon. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I don't right. know. I, just, right. I don't think it's time for Tokatli. I also, uh, the, my, my bigger issue with uh, Nilhide Ferax would normally be the double green, but I think it's important to call out that this deck, despite only 21 land, is actually much smoother on the mana thanks to these four flower flourishes. Sure. Um, but I, th- I think I still want, like, Dawnbringer or something. It's yeah, something that's meaningfully different. Like, Ferox is, like, big, but it's... It's not. It makes the what? Yeah, it makes it. It's awkward. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have enough experience to see if it plays out well enough in practice. You know, the thing I like. But it's also cute when they. You know, if somebody if somebody shows up and tries to the eldest reborn you. Yeah. Well, all I'm going to say is the thing that I like about Dawnbringer is a this deck can actually cast it. It's got a bunch of fives already, like Tristani Discordant. But B, when you're behind and there's so many of these Redwood Aggro decks that are flying around here, you know, obviously six in the top eight, whether or not it was the best deck um, of the tournament, six in the top eight is going to mean that people are going to adopt Healer's Hawk dot deck uh, this weekend in local tournaments, FNMs, what have you. I think like you slam down Dawnbringer. If it doesn't die, you're you're just right back in it, no matter how bad it was a minute ago. I don't know though. The you can still just get it. Uh, maybe it's I mean, just, it can get baffled. It can get tribunal. There's all kinds of stuff that can happen to it. But like, well, it, it also, also just dies to other people. Everybody else is boarding in Vivian Reed. So it's like it's kind of wild to board in a uh, Lyra Dawnbringer when your opponent's boarding in Vivian Reed. All right, maybe it could be okay. I don't get me wrong. I like Lilia. I, I like Lyra. You know. But anyway, the, the, I think Green White is an awesome choice this weekend. It's both uh, the winningest deck from this past weekend, despite no copies in the top eight, thanks to the draft portion. And it's also a good matchup against these white decks, because when your opponent plays Healer's Hawk and Dauntless Bodyguard and all those different types of two ones and one ones and stuff, wow, does Saproling Migration uh, really look good. You know, and March of the Multitudes. Oh, March of the Multitudes. Yeah, March of the Multitudes is just brutal when your opponents are just like, 
tiny, tiny little guys that they're they're spending a card on, and you're spending a card on like five of them, and yours are better. So, right? Yeah. <laughs> So I would definitely check out these green white decks. The, and there were several at the top tables, um, high up that just you know just fell just short of the top eight. And I I, I think the I think green white is definitely a, a strategy to watch. Uh, absolute top of the non top eight decks was uh, mono blue tempo. Looks like right. Yeah, kind of an exciting one. I'm into it. I'm into this one. Um, Especially if you think that people aren't going to play as much mono red aggro, like this is well, going to be the I, archetype that benefits the most. See, I think mono red aggro could be on the climb though, because the god, god I mean, so the goblin chain whirler's positioning for next weekend is going to be so good. I would be interested in in chain whirling, so I wouldn't be so sure to count it out. I think it was a smart move this weekend when only you know thirteen or fourteen percent of people are playing the chain whirler. But uh, Guillaume uh, Gautier's uh, mono blue deck, uh, very 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 similar to uh, Nasif's mono blue deck from uh, a couple weeks ago, Uh, moving one exclusion mage to the main deck, but overall not a whole lot of uh, of craziness. It was kind of cute, the use of Surge Mare in the uh, the sideboard, though. Surge Mare. I in guess... terms of having a durable threat against, uh, you know, people playing, uh, boarding in some of the, uh, be- boarding in some of the, uh, the red removal. Yeah, I mean, it's also a, just get in there, right? If you're playing against Golgari, for example, would you bring in Surge Mare? Uh, I, I don't think so. No? Too much black? Yeah, I'm, I'm not too worried about the evasion, man. Can't be bought by green creatures is not the thing about this dude. It's the it's the wall of ice aspect of the Surge Mirror that you like more than the... It's the combination of I can be a 0-5 some of the time, and then I can attack and draw a card against some people some of the time, too. Um, I like the strategy a lot, uh, Mono Blue, although I don't like it as much as actually just playing Goblin Chain Whirler. That's, that's my current assessment. Yep, but I think I would still. I, I think I think Chain War is a fine choice for this weekend, but I think I would recommend Green White. All right. Which kind? The like the, the kind we just went over. Yep, 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 yep. And uh, maybe even more Crow Harpooner action. Get one of those main deck, man. That guy's nice. I feel like I would play for Crow Harpooner. You really just like that was an impassioned speech. Dude, if anybody ever figures out how to play Carl, uh, the 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 Crowl Harpooner in a deck that can give their guys haste, that's going to be it. Because remember, even if your opponent doesn't have a flyer, you can drop the Harpooner and get the stre- you know get the power bonus and then attack. You just smash them. Yeah, if you just find a way to give your guy haste. Uh, I don't like even... maximum. Maximum velocity, man. Yeah, it's I not mean, a great fit. That's not a great fit. No, no. I mean, green, like the problem is green, red, and standard right now is more of a you have to be kind of dinosaur or rampy to make it work because the land is so bad. So, uh, but you you want that stuff to be real fast, and it's not fast and reliable if you're if you're going beat down. I don't think. Oh, so by the way, there was a, a different uh, control deck that wanted to call out uh, Esper, which did do it did well on day one. Uh, not very many people; only five people played it. Four of them made day two, but the uh, uh, n- you know none of them ended up breaking out too much. They did well from draft. The highest finisher was uh, only top hundred, but this this list maybe is the starting point for something new. Uh, Atsuki Kahara's list, uh, which was a an Esper control deck featuring um, a pretty even split between the colors. Black for Golden Demise, X4 main deck, as well as two Vraska's Contempt and three of the Eldest Reborn. What do you think of four Golden Demise main deck in this white aggro metagame? I mean, Golden Demise is basically just Esper's Stephanie Clarion, right? 
It is, but it doesn't get stopped by Dauntless Bodyguard, by the all your creatures have indestructible. It, uh, it, you know, it, it hits from us. It doesn't. It also kills a Danto Vanguard. Oh well, that's good. I mean, a Danto Vanguard is such an overperformer unless the opponent's playing red. It's uh, it's awesome. It's awesome against control, and as long as you're attacking with it, it's it's pretty good against white decks, right? It's just terrible against red. It is uh, very telling how prepared Kahara was for a Danto Vanguard with four main deck seal away, four main deck golden demise, two main deck Vraska's contempt, and then also having access to two settle the wreckage, three the eldest reborn, four to fair. And every card in this deck is like how to fight an Adanto Vanguard. I mean, blink of an eye and settle the wreckage kill it just fine, also, right? If you're on the play, yep. syncopating it is fine, also. I mean, and syncopate it means it. <laughs> Yep, and this is uh, this is a list with four syncopate, four sinister sabotage. The use of four syncopate and no amount of essence scatter or negate, I think, is actually really smart for this past weekend because of how much. Uh, if you look at a lot of these white decks, they're really split. You know, like they've got history of Benalia, and they've got Conclave Tribunal, and they've got Legion's Landing, and they've you know, and and sometimes even just making two one ones and then giving all their guys plus one plus one in haste. I mean the amount of both creatures and non-creatures they have that are threats at every spot in the curve makes it really hard to rely on negate or essence scatter compared to just having a syncopate so do you like this strategy do you think this is like a good way to go if you don't want to be white weenie right now this is a deck that would be fun to test and see if it was good because if this deck was good it would be sweet like if i didn't have a ton of time to prepare i think i would just play green white i think like one of the things that I really like about this deck is, as you said, it's very well prepared to start with for um, Adanto Vanguard. The presence of Eldest Reborn actually makes it like medium, like pretty well prepared for um, for Golgari, right? You can combine your like, I mean, not that Golden Demise is the best, but it actually still probably get its money uh, pretty reasonably. Yeah. It's, you, can, you need somebody to clean up the mess against those random explore dudes or whatever. Yeah, like they're just three, two, whatever. They kill them most of the time. So, you know, you get rid of that stuff and then you can you can get them with, with Eldest Reborn. You can even get Carnage Tyrant this way, right? So it, it, he's kind of got that. But I think, like, if you're up against Jeskai, the presence of one plus one copies of Chromium the Mutable, I think, have got to make you the favorite against Jeskai. It's even better yeah. than than... Than uh you know the dinosaur against them because the flat I I don't know I don't know I don't know like the the fact that chromium is like uh, it's slow and you didn't put pressure on them in other ways I think it's really good to be sure it's just that I think the expansion explosion is pretty good in the mirror too and it's not like if Miz it's that bad. Um, I think that the Eldest Reborn is a really big weapon because I think that if you can ever just... The fact that Eldest Reborn is such a powerful follow-up to Crackling Drake, to Fairy, or niv Mizzet is just so brutal. So I feel like this deck is just missing Disinformation Campaign, though. Do you, like, in the set? Nah, nah, I don't think it has enough... Uh, I don't think it has enough Surveil. I think the thing... It, I do agree it's missing a little card draw. The thing I think is missing is Chemister's Insight. Yeah, I was looking for Chemister's Insight, but the reason that my mind went to the campaign is just because um, Atsuki chose to play Thought Erasure in his sideboard. Right, like... That's a yeah, but you're not going to play Disinformation Campaign when the only Surveil you have is Thought Erasure and Sinister Sabotage. I mean, that's... A one disinformation campaign is on the order, right? I'm not saying like it's exactly it's on the order of a divination, right? Like it's up, it's one up, one it's down. More like a, it's more like a uh, mind ravel. <laughs> you are correct. It is much more like a mind ravel. Mind ravel, I will remind you, is a card that you brutalized me with innumerable times in games of mental magic a decade or plus, you know, or more ago. Three costs, make them discard a card, and you draw a card. Yeah, so, um, yeah, but I, I, the, I think the deck on, is light on, on card advantage. 
on the note of uh, of uh, these sort of um, surveil techniques, one thing I thought was really cool were some of the uh, some of the guys playing Golgari with Doom Whisperer had one copy of Golgari Raiders in their oh, deck. I love it. One copy love of Golgari Raiders, it. three and a green, zero, zero haste elf that gets plus one, plus one, a uh, plus one, plus one counter for each creature card in your graveyard. So what you could do is if you ever were playing against a control deck, you could just tap out, play Doom Whisperer. They tap out to Cleansing Nova you or whatever, you know, Star of Extinction, anything, whatever. They go boom, and then you, on your, in response, you necro as hard as it, as you can. You know, you try to go all the way down to two if you need to, but you just keep going and you find your Golgari Raider, and then you just crack them back for basically lethal. Because all those extra cards that you were pitching all go to the graveyard, meaning this Golgari Raider is going to come down and be huge. Yeah, so. Doom Whisperer can surveil too, right? So even if you're putting one, um, the Golgari Raider back on top, you can continue to leave it on top while digging for more creatures, right? Right. And remember, you just got your board swept anyway from the Star of Extinction or the uh, Cleansing Nova or whatever. And that's to say nothing of anything else that died earlier in the game. Plus, like, uh, you don't always fall, find Golgari Raider at the beginning. You might just flip 10 cards before you get to the Golgari Raider, assuming you even find it, you know? It's solid. Very solid. Uh, so what do you think, man? Uh, what, what would you play next week? Uh, I tell you what I will play is very likely to be Mono Red. Uh, I played Mono Red last week. I thought it was awesome. Um, and uh, I, I, I would just play the same 75 that I played last week, which is basically the deck that won the French Grand Prix. I think maybe I'm like sure. one or two cards off in the sideboard. The one thing that I, I was like toying with testing was Azura's Gateway instead of Treasure Map in the sideboard. Nah, um, stick to the maps. Yeah, it, 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 I was like, oh man, I kind of want to try Gateway because you know there are enough casting costs once you once you factor in the mountains to to get the flip. But I actually, my first match, uh, I beat a Boros deck only because of the extra land that I got from the you know the extra the mana from yep. the treasures. If I didn't get the extra mana from the treasures, I would have definitely lost because uh, I had to use it like the turn that I flipped in order to cast a bunch of spells while under pressure um, from from boros so that wouldn't have happened if i had had the the, uh, the azor's gateway because on best case scenario it takes two two more turns to flip yeah and frequently longer oh yeah, yeah i mean there's literally experimental frenzy and two precious copies of rekindling phoenix at the four so like you just don't have that many fours and so you got to get like a four a three a two a one and a land that's the only way you can flip it in in mono red, and there are just not very many fours. Yep. And it's not like you want to be pitching them. I don't know. Both of your fours are insane, right? Like, yeah. so you you don't want to anyway. Yep. Yes, mono red for me. Uh, little if any variation from the Grand Prix winning deck. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I mean, its matchup against the Danto Vanguard is so good. Like. You shock that Vanguard. They they hate it. They pay four. You untap it. You just slam down the the uh, Goblin Chain Whirler, and they're like, you gonna do it again? And like sometimes they say yes. Like they don't even have combat capability. Are they gonna attack you? Your guy's first strike, right? Like here's my twelve damage. Yeah. Here's my technology for the weekend. Uh, Shiv and Fury. Like Shiv I think that Fury. I think that uh, the how fa- like it, as an early tempo play, whether you're playing against mono red, mono white, uh, I mean I guess Boros or uh, or you're playing against green white, hit the uh, soul of a Minaria, you know the if you are playing against mono blue, any of these things, and the fact that you can kick it is such a like against uh, the Arclight Phoenix X, you can kill the Phoenix on the way in, but you could kick it to kill the Drakes. I mean, um, Shiv and Fire, you mean right? Shiv and Fire, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it, got it. I think that Shiv and Fire is. Uh, I think Shiv and Fire is. I'm a big buyer I, I, in it for this weekend. Uh, in what strategy? In mono red? Any, any, like Jess guy. Uh, anybody that's playing a sort of. Uh, really, I don't know. Jess guy is the primary one. But <laughs> I think that if you're playing with any amount of red removal, I would take a look at Shiv and Fire. I like Shiv and Fire a lot. I just think it's just specifically in mono red. Um, I think Mono Red wants Shock more than Shivenfire because of the ability. You need the face. Yeah, you, know, you do. And if I, think, I think you're right. 
you know, if you're trying to kill creatures, it already has fight with fire and lava coil both, which are for their specific jobs, I think, just better in, in that strategy. But I think Shivan Fire is probably great in, in Jeskai. Maybe also, like, I think the tempo play you can make in Drakes is actually probably pretty good, right? Because they, they're very happy to have shock and they're not shocking face that often. Right. Well, sweet. Uh, I think this was definitely a, a pro tour for uh, uh, one for the prepared technology. You know, draft ended up being a high leverage format. The constructed format is the best we've seen in a while. And even though the format was a couple months old, lots of surprises, lots of twists and turns. Yeah, even though we've seen Boros decks of various stripes do so well since the very first week when Boros Angels was winning. Um, these Boros decks that did well at the at the Pro Tour, including the winner, including LSV, were so different than the decks that we'd seen before. The winner, I, Andrew? Yeah. Yeah. His deck was, I, I mean, not different from other decks in the top eight. Like, the, those decks had a lot of similarities, but it was way different from, for example, Brad's list, right, from the Grand Prix a few weeks ago. Way different from Boros. Uh, completely different archetype. Completely different archetype. Yeah, so. yeah, same colors. It's just so much evolution. Some of the similar cards, but definitely going in you know new directions. Yep. So I think, and I think that there's still more to come in this standard. It is going to continue to be diverse. Yep. Very very cool. Good stuff, man. All right. See you next week, Patrick. See you then. Good luck. So jail or hate Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase Your core trapped in amber stasis please Lost a lot of friends got left behind Had to find a way not to lose my mind Trapped in a vault with nothing but time Parents and my friends were the key to find Magic gave me purpose and drive The game, the love, 